Welcome and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think you're doing, they're doing with your DNA? You know that 23andMe swab you sent off and you were so excited about it? Just heard it the other day on uh, Fox News that the whole panel had sent theirs off and they were revealing who they were and what that was all about. And, you know, it's fun, it's interesting, and it's not like you're giving away something really, really personal like your uh, identity. Uh, where somebody could uh, take your DNA and steal your identity. But what if there was somebody, somebody you did not want to know was interested in your DNA, and that's Satan. You say, Satan is interested in my DNA? Yes, he is, my friends, and that's because there's a Y chromosome marker within the DNA that determines whether or not you're in the line of Aaron. That's correct, Aaron of the Bible. And the one whose descendant has to take up his rightful position as the head of the Sanhedrin, as the high priest, in the bloodline of Aaron to call for the return of Jesus. Read Matthew 23, uh, 37 to 39, and hear Jesus himself say, Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, if they could weaponize that DNA and Satan could take out that Levitical line, then guess what? Satan continues to rule this earth. And that is the plot line over the best-selling thriller, The Codist. Sold out the first edition. Second edition is now out and available to you. Just $2.99 on Kindle, and the paperback is also available there on Amazon. I want you to also visit our website, IgnitiaNation.com, and click on our special offers. There you're going to see the cover of this book, yellow <laughs> cover, entitled The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey from the natural into the supernatural. Now, when you click on that book cover, we're going to ask for your email. We're going to not send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book for free as we take you on this incredible journey where God reveals seven laws and seven lessons within each one of those laws. It's my honor to introduce you to our guest, Steve Smith, author of Spirit Walk, The Extraordinary Power of Acts for Everyday People. His 2011 book, T4T, A Discipleship Re-Revolution, the story behind the world's fastest growing church planning movement and how it can happen in your com community, is considered the definitive work on, church, on the church planting movement with tens of thousands of copies of books in circulation in 20 languages across the globe. His two-volume No Place Left fiction series about finishing the Great Commission Hastening and Rebirth has been described by CPM trainers as a mission training manual in a novel. Well known in the mission world and with a BA in New Testament Greek, a master's in divinity and theology, a master's in theology and a doctorate in theology in missionology, Steve Smith has always approached his work with energy and purpose. But now, now there's an increased sense of urgency to his efforts as he's recently shared, as many of you know, I am battling cancer right now. God has impressed upon me to write two more books while I still have time. The first, this book, Spirit Walk, is my most important book to date. You can follow Steve Smith right there on his website at stevesmithbooks.com. Steve Smith, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Eric. It's a great honor to be here with you. Uh, what, what a spectacular work you've done. Uh, you have challenged the church at large with a message that uh, is no less uh, convicting than Revelation chapter 2, which says, hmm. I've seen your great work, but this I hold against you. Look at the heights from which you've fallen. You've forsaken your first love, the Holy Spirit. And this is the essential message of the book as to how to do two things. First of all, understand and grab a hold of this concept of pneuma in the Greek or uh, ruach in the Hebrew. What was it that really grabbed a hold of you that made you recognize that this is something that denominationally uh, hmm. is, um, it's really a, it's a pandemic of, uh, of sp spiritus or, yeah. or, or no. a, a depletion of the spirit? Well, you know, I was raised in a pretty conservative um, Bible teaching church all my life. And, you know, I just walked the traditional, you know, go to Sunday school, go to church, you know, go to training meetings and so forth, prayer meetings. And sort of really my senior year in high school, 
I began to just get so hungry for the Word of God. I was just pouring over my Bible, and especially when I would get to like Luke or Acts, where you kept talking about the Holy Spirit coming. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I just kept asking the question, what's, what's that all about? Because really, I could pretty much do what I do in the Christian walk without the help of the Holy Spirit. It felt like, I mean, I had all these props around me that propped up my Christian life. So I remember going to one of our staff members and just asking him, I said, I said, can you tell me what it means to really learn to walk in the Spirit? And I just got shut down uh, as if that was something that other denominations do. It's not something that we do. And I began to realize that I was missing out on just an essential part of what the Bible is teaching that every believer needs to walk in step with the Spirit. So I just began a journey of studying that. I went every place I could go to learn from that. And, you know, there's a lot of weird things that go on out there about the Holy Spirit. But what I began to learn is that every Bible-believing Christian should be actually the most Spirit-filled Christian. And unfortunately, in our functional theology that we had in our church growing up, our theology of the Trinity was Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. We were replacing the Holy Spirit with Scripture, which we, we need Scripture, obviously, but we really had no clue. We were, we, we were, you know, we had amnesia when it came to understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in history and the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer today. And I attempted to recover that because I felt like that was critical. Steve, and even, go ahead. I was 44 years old when I said the quote-unquote sinner's prayer. But mm -hmm. right after I said it, I went down front, and as I grabbed a hold of the Messianic rabbi, I, I said to him, uh, I, have to talk, I, I need to talk to you right away after the service for what I just said. And he said, well, okay, I'll be happy to meet with you. So we go to his office, and I say to him, okay, um, you know, I've got this Jewish mind. I've just said, um, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, that he rose again on the third day, and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. And because he lives, I can live now and forevermore. I said, but how is it that I ask him into my heart, but he's not here, he's there, I don't understand. And he just looked at me and he said, well, it was just the words of the... Of the I said, no, I've opened my heart to receive Jesus, and then I immediately, in my next statement, say, but he's not here, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he said to me, well, uh, as your rabbi of old would have told you, you need to go on a pursuit to dig into this. And so that's when I discovered on my own that what was being deposited in me was not only just the Holy Spirit, but the light, the light mm -hmm. of God, as Jesus mm -hmm. said, uh, when I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now I'm leaving. Now you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine. So there has to be a deposit of light and mm -hmm. a deposit of the Spirit because I've just professed. I opened my heart to receive Jesus, but he's not here. And so right. I have to tell you that my, my logical brain said it's, it's, a, it's a conflicting statement. I've opened my heart to something that I can't get, so what is it that I get? And mm. that's when I very immature walk began this pursuit of understanding what did I just open my heart to receive? Exactly. And, and uh, it is the same pattern of Pentecost. Jesus is here for 40 days after the resurrection. And then he goes and he ascends to heaven. Uh, and there's a 10 day period of time where mm -hmm. we are, are waiting for this comforter to come. And, of course, in the upper room, are they looking for a person? Are they looking for a knock on the door? So they gather every day in anticipation of we're holding on to this promise. And, of course, it came on a very specific day. Uh, and we're told of this day in Jeremiah 31:31. Uh, where God says, Behold, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It won't be like the old covenant written on tablets of stone. Now he writes it on our heart. 
on that day that Moses came down from the mountain, 3,000 died. Now 3,000 get saved. It's 50 days from the Exodus and 50 days from the resurrection. And now we see the parallels of God, who is the great Redeemer, sending mm -hmm. us a redemptive part of himself that is invisible but powerful. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and you know, what's, what struck me is I, I've been on this journey for the last you know, 40 years learning to walk in the power of the Spirit increasingly day by day. And what struck me really was how many believers, doesn't matter their denominational background, have forgotten this thing that we call the Spirit walk, which is a way that early disciples knew. They knew to walk by the power of the Spirit. All Paul had to say was to the Ephesians was, don't get drunk with wine. Remember, be continually filled with the Spirit. To the Galatians, he would say, remember, you, you were born by the Spirit, now keep in step with the Spirit. But here's the interesting thing. I've worked with missionaries now for the last 20 years, uh, all, over, all over the world. And when we think, in terms of the, the Christian world, when we think of the pinnacle of spirituality, we would put missionaries sort of at that top in terms of their sacrifice. And I've had many, many, many missionaries tell me this. I was busy doing my work. But one told me just two days, two days ago, the missing piece for me was the Spirit. And when I read Spirit Walk, and he, he had just gotten his book, he said, when I, when I read Spirit Walk, it, that was finally the, the piece that I needed to take my efforts and take my methods and imbue them with the power of Jesus, because the Holy Spirit in the New Testament twice is called the Spirit of Jesus. I had another uh, missionary tell me the other day, he came from a, a very Pentecostal background. But he said, you know, what I had learned growing up was that I needed a one-time experience. And what I'm trying to understand now from, from the book and what I've come to understand is that I need to learn how to experience him afresh every day. And now I have to help my pastors and my staff at my church learn to talk about what does it mean to daily be filled with the Spirit, daily walk and surrender to him and be led by him every hour. You know, you're going through a battle with cancer, and they're radiating you, they're uh, killing off cells, they're watching the cells that are being born again, uh, <laughs> this renewal, and we go to 2 Corinthians 5.17, and Paul writes, anybody who's in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. And so people would say to me, well, that's the born-again experience. That's what happens the day you accept Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not what he's saying. I went to bed last night, and I had certain numbers, certain cells. I had certain number of hairs. I had certain, and that changed overnight. My body chemistry literally changed. Some cells died. New cells grew. Some cells elongated. Some cells shortened. There was a complete exchange of fluids being processed. Everything was different. The person that went to bed was not the person that woke up metabolically, chemically. Uh, there were changes that took place. And so as I began to read that passage and say, wait a second, I'm a new creation every day. And if I walk as a new creation every day, then I can do what Paul says, not that I've accomplished this, but this I do, forgetting what's behind, I press on. I, I can only do that by walking in forgiveness. And the only way you can walk in forgiveness is to be filled with the Spirit because we all are justified. Right. Every one right. of us is justified to hold a grudge. But none of us are permitted according to the Word of God. And if we are walking with Jesus, then we have to take the attitude, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That's right. That's I the power. I had, I had a missionary tell me this after he went through this whole process of what's in Spirit Walk. Um, he told me, he said, for years I had tried to have the fruit of the Spirit without the source. I was pursuing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, those, all the fruit of the Spirit. But he said, I was trying to do it in my own power. He said, I could, I could maintain one or two for a limited period of time. But once I realized that the problem was I wasn't pursuing the source and resigned myself to going back to saying, I just want to be full of the Spirit of God. Then the fruit, here's what he said, the fruit became effortless to execute. And I think that's the order we've got to get things into. I want to live in the power of the fruit of the Spirit. I want to live in the gifts that God's given me, 
but they're useless. They're a, a part of knowing the person of the Spirit, and he's a person that we get to know. He's not an it. He's not a force. It's very important that we know this is a relationship that we're cultivating. It's, it's so interesting. Your description uh, is like a, it's, it's like a lamp. Uh, a lamp is a lamp, but it doesn't give off any light unless it's plugged into the source of power. And so here we are, two and a half billion strong in the world, two and a half billion lamps. Uh, imagine if we really did what we were commanded, let our light so shine, that would be 2.5 billion candle power, uh, each one of us adding to another, which would send a beam straight up to the heaven that the whole world would be drawn to. If you and I could stand anywhere in the world and see this beam of light heading up to the heavens, it would be enough to draw like a moth to a flame, which is the example mm -hmm. we're given in the Bible. But we don't let our light shine because we're unplugged from the source, and the source is the Holy Spirit. That's right. And you know, when I was, when I was a young father, I was making this rocking horse or rocking lion for my, my children, and I had a cordless drill, and I was trying to drill through oak, and it was, had a battery on it, and I would get it working and go and run down. And I'd plug that battery back in and it'd do the same thing. And I was making no progress until one day I borrowed a corded drill from my father. I plugged that thing into the wall and it just began to scream. And nothing stopped it because I had plugged it into the source. And I find that most Christians, we try to go on these doses we get from Sundays or whenever we meet with other believers and try to last on that as if that will sustain us through the week when we're not plugged into the source, which is knowing the Spirit of God personally in our lives, learning how to listen to His voice and how to walk in His power. Steve, we read about the conversation that Rabbi Nicodemus had with Jesus uh, as he went mm -hmm. to midnight so that he wouldn't be uh, identified by the Sanhedrin as, uh, as really a, a, almost a traitor. And he asks him, how do I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And he tells him you have to be born again. Now, of course, this is a Jew talking to a Jew. So being born again is something that we understand in Tavila, in water immersion, that what goes into the water does not come out of the water. The water washes away, and so you're washed clean under the Levitical system. And, and in still even today, John the Baptist, John the Immerser, uh, still today we use full water immersion or sprinkling or splashing, doesn't really matter. Uh, I believe in full water immersion because it's biblical in the mikvah uh, from the Old Testament. But he says that you have to be born again, and he says, well, how can I go back in my mother's womb? And he says, you can't. What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. Mm -hmm. We are called to be spiritual beings. We are not called to be fleshly beings. Now, your title, Spirit Walk, and, and I shared this with you before we went on the air, um, grabbed a hold of me like two, two handlebars on a, on a big Harley. Spirit <laughs> and walk. Okay? The, the concept of walking with God uh, is as old as, as, the, as Genesis 2, uh, when, when God is actually walking with Adam. Adam is not walking with God, and the juxtaposition of the noun-verb relationship of who's walking with who has to be clarified because we see that when you do walk with God like Enoch did or Noah did, that you were righteous or more righteous, uh, mm -hmm. you were different, you were set apart, and this became the pattern for walking with God. Now walking with God in the spirit means that I have transcended flesh, I've now plugged into a power source that enables me to walk with God and not see death. This is extraordinary. We become like the Enochs. We become like the Elijahs. We become uh, uh, transformed into this new creation, which carries with it a ministry of reconciliation, carries with it an ambassadorship, carries with it the role of a prophet as if we were speaking God's very words as his messenger, and we're just not doing that because we don't have clarity 
and the I agree. and the clarity is what your book is. Your book, exactly. your book is not just a what to, because God tells us a lot of what tos in the Bible, exactly. but He does not always tell us how to, and that's why we have. I, I call them commentators in the South, that would be an ordinary potato. There's a lot of opinions out there. I don't take a lot of them. I usually let Scripture interpret Scripture. But when it comes to this tangible but intangible, visible yet invisible, power, mm -hmm. we need a how-to to step yeah. into it. And we need, right. we need an understanding of why. What is the compelling argument for why do I need to do this? And now mm -hmm. once I'm convinced why do I need to do this, then I need to grab a hold of the why and the how. And that's, that's exactly right. what Spirit Walk is. It's, a, it's an ex it is. extraordinary journey. We're talking with Steve Smith, author of the newly re released book, Spirit Walk, The Extraordinary Power of Acts for Ordinary People. It is the compelling argument for why the church needs to be reawakened to exactly what got them into the church in the first place, and that was the Spirit of God. The prayers of the righteous who got you into church, that got you into the kingdom. And if you think you got there on your own, then you're sadly mistaken. There's a whole lineup of people waiting to tell you, I prayed for you. When I was eight years old, my gym teacher named me Nicodemus. I had no idea why at the time, didn't know what that meant, thought it was actually kind of making fun of me. I didn't know until my 40s that he was actually prophesying over me that I would become a Jewish man to approach Jesus and say, how do I inherit the kingdom of heaven? This is a book filled with wisdom, filled with understanding, and filled with the most compelling argument that I've seen for why you need to walk in the Spirit. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig into the text of this book with Steve Smith, author of Spirit Walk. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatic Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. 
In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Steve Smith, author of the newly released book, Spirit Walk, The Extraordinary Power of Acts for Ordinary People. Steve, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. Steve, the, uh, my favorite line almost in the entire Bible is the last line of Acts chapter 2. And, you know, we all love the giving of the Spirit and the shaking and the smoke and the tongues of fire and the and the speaking and praying in tongues and all those things, which is the exact same picture as it was on Mount Sinai when Moses went up. It's a perfectly symmetrical p description of the presence of God there. But the last line is, and God added to their numbers daily those being saved, meaning mm. we don't have that responsibility. You and I and every pastor and minister have been relieved of the responsibility of, quote, unquote, saving people. Uh, it's God's job to bring salvation. It's you and I to be the messenger, the ambassador, the mm -hmm. voice, mm -hmm. the hands and the feet, the, the hearers and the doers. But a lot of people don't know how. They, they, okay. they, they're enamored with Pentecost. They, they embrace it in its entirety, but then they step away from it and say, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could have been there and we could have had that experience? And I'm thinking to myself, you are there, uh, you can have that experience, but Steve, they just don't know how. And that's that, right. And that's what we find in Spirit Walk. So t take me through this that, that in our audience to understand this concept that, um, uh, of SWAP and the acronym yep. and uh, our understanding of how do we swap out our agenda for his sure. agenda. Well, and I think the way you, 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 you put that into introduction is perfect because Jesus twice said, you know, in Luke 24 and Acts 1-8, essentially this message, you guys are ready, but wait. Until you've received power from on high, then you will go and be my witnesses. And as I mentioned in the earlier part of the show, I'm finding whether it's an ordinary believer who's been in the faith for a few years or the furthest missionary out on the front line someplace in a very dark, remote area, there's a lot of spiritual amnesia about what does it actually mean to walk in the Spirit. And In fact, one missionary told me, I kept hearing for years pastors say, be filled with the Spirit, but there was never any explanation of how do I do that. And in my frustration to try to train 
missionaries and pastors and church planters how to do that, I began to just pour over the scripture and look at two things. One, what were the commands that were given, the instructions that were given regarding walking in the Spirit? And then second, what were the examples that were illustrating those commands? And we always want to go in that order. We want to get the instructions first and then let the illustrations from the stories help us understand what that means. And what emerged would be not a a three-step process to being filled with the Spirit. That's a pretty much that's a pretty sacrilegious type of thing to say because if God is God, then God's the one who decides how and when He's going to move upon us. But He loves to fill His kids with His Spirit. And so our Father longs to fill us with the Spirit, but what He's looking for is the right type of postures of our hearts that can receive that. And in order to take all of the biblical teachings and put them into a way that, first of all, I could remember daily. I mean, literally every morning in my devotional time, I try to go through this this swap process, S-W-A-P. And the way I just say it is how to swap your control for God's control each day. And another mistake we often make is we think, well, I, I was filled with the Spirit a while back. The real question is not, have you ever been filled with the Spirit? The question is, are you full of the Spirit today? And if you can answer that question, yes, then you walk out your door, and listening to the Spirit of God, you begin to engage in the things He's given you for that day. So the the point of Spirit Walk really is to take us step by step through that process of what the Bible says, and then really this is just a pointer. Uh, And here's what I mean by that. Uh, I don't want to suppose that if you just go through the SWAP acronym, which I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, that you're going to you know, instantly be filled with the Spirit. Because again, the Holy Spirit, you know, the disciples waited for 10 days in the upper room. And so the Holy Spirit dictates His timetable, we don't dictate His. And understanding that, uh, a pastor who just got his book a couple of weeks ago, just went off into a retreat site for two or three days, just to go and wait. And do the things that are in the book and say, Lord, I'm here, I'm waiting on you. Would you act upon me so that I know I'm full of you from this moment on and walking in your power and in your presence? And so that kind of led me to this acronym. And what I found was that really everything that the Bible teaches about walking in the Spirit could be summarized in four basic areas. And the first three sort of are all together in one process, but we need to understand the elements of this process. The first one was that the disciples were always at a point of surrendering. They would, because, you know, I have a a glass here that's full of water, and the only way to fill this glass with juice would be to pour out the water so I can fill it with juice. And the same thing is true, the receptacles of our spiritual lives are filled with our own thoughts, our own pride, our own control. And the only way that I'm going to be filled with the Spirit and let let His mind control me is I must empty myself, and that's a process called surrender, where we surrender to the will of God, we surrender to every word we see in the Scripture. But at the same time, going through that surrendering process, it's a waiting process, which is the W. And you almost, I I can't even think of one example of disciples that were filled with the Spirit, that there was not a process of waiting before that time in prayer, saying, God, we want you, we know you're there, come to us, we're surrendering to you. And I find sometimes God only makes me wait a few hours or a few minutes, but sometimes he makes me wait a few days because there's some deep, deep things he's wanting to work out of my life, or work into my life. And then the disciples not only surrendered, they waited in prayer, but then a third thing they did was, when you look at Ephesians 5.18, where it says, be filled with the Spirit, it starts with Ephesians 4.16 that goes through 5.17, where it's a whole litany of sins to put off and the holy opposites to put on. And at the very end of that, rooting out of sin process, then he says, be filled with the Spirit. And the A is we want to avoid any sin, even even a hint of sin. Paul says, don't even name the things that people do in, in secret. 
And so this is a very short summary. It's not doesn't do justice based upon the book, but as we surrender, as we uh, as we wait in prayer, and as we avoid, you know, any sin or root it out, confess it, then we are led to the P of that SWAP acronym, which is the whole point of Spirit Walk, and that is the prompted responses the Spirit's going to give to His child to say, "My son, my daughter, here's how to walk." Turn this way, turn that way, speak to him, take your child out for an ice cream. Whatever it is, the Spirit's going to be prompting us, and every time we say yes, we stay full of the Spirit. But any time we say no, then we grieve the Spirit, and he retreats to part of our life because he doesn't have control again, and we have to surrender again afresh. And this process, can it takes a long time to master but it's an acronym that's easy enough to remember so that even I, who, you know, groggy in the morning with a cup of coffee with my Bible open, I can remember that and say, today I want to be full of him. Steve, do you find that this demystifies the <clears throat> baptism of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, people, people have, there's, this, there's, this, there's two extremes here. One, we don't want to have anything to do with that baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, so many mainline Christians and evangelical Christians have let Pentecostal, what they've heard of Pentecostal excesses or charismatic extremes, rob them of the joy and the power of walking in the Spirit. On the other extreme, I've seen Pentecostal friends who, because they had a one-time experience, then they thought that was good for life. No, that was just an introduction <laughs> into daily walking in the Spirit, you know. And so I think that we have to remove the mystery from around the Holy Spirit. I mean, he's all through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, as he talks to the believers in the New Testament. This is the normal Christian walk. And how can we walk it without his help every day? You know, I go to Israel every year, uh, and I take what I call pilgrims with me, uh, 48 Christians who want to get to know the people of the book and the land of the book and the spirit of the living God. And I actually tell them, you know, for most of your Christian life, <clears throat> a call to God has been a long distance call. Uh, when we go to Israel, it's a local call. And they're introduced in the first day they spend with me. We go to a Davidic praise and worship service on the top of Mount Carmel, right near where uh, Elijah took on the prophets of Baal. There's a, a wonderful Messianic congregation there. And they get to experience an hour of worship, not three songs, announcements, offering, and another song and a message, but an hour of worship and uh, uh, a, a message that is actually so infused with Scripture that it might be more Scripture than they got in the last year of the two verses that they got every Sunday than the expository teaching. And I do that so they can see that the Spirit is alive and well and doing just fine. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to introduce you to your new best friend because the Holy Spirit is. You know, uh, people say Jesus is my best friend. Uh, Okay, and I'm, I'm fine with that, but how does that manifest in your life? Um, mm -hmm. It's the power, it's the dunamis, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit that we are imbued with, we're, we're endowed with. This is the gift that he sent to us. He said, I'm going to send you a gift. There's going to be a knock on the door of your heart. And I want you to open your heart to receive this gift. This is where you're going to find comfort. This is where you're going to find solace. This is your direct connection to God through me right there. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the doorbell ringing two times instead of just the normal one time. Uh, and you go to the head of the line because you, you, you got this special ring and you're walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Mm -hmm. we, we, we all say that, but the anointing comes from the Holy Spirit. Yes, it does. And, and you know, if I could just take, take us back to sort of the bookends on the Gospels, 
you know, one of the bookends is Jesus calling those first disciples to begin to walk with him as his followers, as his learners, as his disciples. And in Mark 1.17, you know, he sees Peter and Andrew, and then he sees James and John, and he s- says the same thing to them. He says, come and follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. And it's right there at the beginning of those Gospels that I think we see the DNA planted of what it means to be a disciple. It means that we're ones that walk with Jesus and and live on mission for him. It's sort of like if I take take this coin right here, Jesus' call to become a disciple involves two aspects. The first is walk, walk with him no matter where he goes, what he says. And then second, learn to become a fisher of men. And I can't, I can't separate these two from each other. But I've, it took me, honestly, 11 years as a Christian, after you know, praying a prayer when I was a child, to understand the first aspect of totally being surrendered to walk with Jesus no matter where he went, no matter what he said. And it took me several more years to understand that I needed to learn to become a witness for him wherever I went. Well, that's the first bookend. That's what discipleship was always meant to be. And then the second bookend, as we get to the end of the the Gospels and we get into Acts, was, and the only way you're going to do this walk is by the Spirit. So you're called to this walk, which is extraordinary. And second, you're called to do it by the power of the Spirit. And I'm, I'm honestly, right now, my main role is coaching movements of God around the world. Over 650 just acts-like movements where churches are multiplying, disciples are multiplying, leaders are multiplying. And in all of them, the rampant phenomenon is the power of the Holy Spirit enabling ordinary believers to follow Jesus and fish for men who then help other believers that are newer than them do the same thing. And someone has said it recently here in North America, you know, what, what we call, you know, Pentecostalism, the rest of the world calls Christianity. And what they mean by that is that the rest of the world, they understand Holy Spirit. He's not a mystery to them. In fact, he's a necessity to them. Why is he no longer a necessity to, to us? And what I found was it wasn't until I left the States and went to a remote country and began working with a remote people group and had no props. I had no sermons that I could broadcast in. I had you know, no Bible study helps. I had nothing that I realized I needed the Holy Spirit more than ever. Now transport someone like that back to North America. Let's not let the props become the substitute for the power of the Spirit working in our life daily. Well, you, you have <clears throat> hit on one of my favorite platforms uh, to speak from, and that is the, the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we have forsaken this first love. We have fallen away. Uh, it is that power which is what convicts me at night. It is that very voice of the Holy Spirit that says that uh, in passing I might have made uh, a not a spirit-filled comment, and it will eat at me uh, in my belly until I either shoot out a text message or an email that says, listen, in passing today, I'm sorry if I sounded this way. It was not my intention. And I cannot rest under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is Mm. not God himself. This is not Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit that is within me, which keeps me in check and seasons my words with salt and light. And if they get too salty, Uh, it dials it back for me, and I'll lay there until I bring resolution to this and make things right with the Lord, or I can't can't sleep, and I'm a great sleeper. So uh, this is fully operational and fully active and has to be engaged. It's, It's like a car in park is what our spiritual walk has been for so many years, and all God is asking us to do through your work is to take that car that you're so familiar with, the engine's running, take it out of park and put it in drive and know that when the drive train is engaged and you give it the gas, this is the power of the Holy Spirit that you're, that's the gas, that's 
that, that's right. That's getting this thing moving, and it's not as complicated, and it's also not as divisive as right. it's been made out to be. And you know, I think the thing that worries most Christians I meet is when we get to that P on the swap, the prompted responses, and people always say, "Well, am I gonna? Am I going to start doing really weird things? Am I gonna start barking like a dog?" And I said, "You're only going to become as weird as Jesus." Because it's the spirit of Jesus in you. So whatever Jesus did, you're going to begin to do. And it's actually interesting. If you look at the book of Acts and you look at the, the common response to every filling of the spirit, it wasn't tongues, although tongues happened a lot, but it was always that the believers spoke the word of God with boldness. In some way, speaking out, praising God in loud voices, and I love going back to Ephesians 5.18, where he says, be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, here are some things that will result. You're going to address one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You're going to sing and make melody with your heart and your heart to the Lord. And you're going to give thanks always, and this is a key, for everything. I honestly think a lot of us, you know, we, we subscribe to 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and 18, where it says, give thanks in all things, but here he actually says, give thanks for all things. And you're right, I am battling a pretty rare form of cancer. And my wife and I made a decision, if we were going to respond to this in the power of the Spirit, that we were gonna give God thanks for everything, the good news or the bad news. Because we know our Father is absolutely in control, he's absolutely loving, and he knows what he's doing, and on the timeline of eternity, this brief life, whether it's 56 years or 96 years, makes sense on that timeline. And I'll tell you, Eric, as we've praised God, like when we get a bad report and we just praise God, Lord, we don't understand why, but we give you thanks for a bad report today. You're a good father. You know what you're doing. It completely takes away the sting of that. And that's only possible, honestly, in the power of the Spirit. You, there's just no other way to live life. Otherwise, you become bitter and dried up and anemic in your faith. Steve, can we even begin to fulfill the Great Commission, fulfill uh, the truth, about 1,050 commands that are, are given to us in the New Testament about uh, blessing those who curse us and praying for those who despitefully use us and feeding our enemies and turning the other cheek and all the things we're supposed to do. Can we do any of that in our own strength? And if we cannot, then by what strength do we do it? And the answer it's, is... It's impossible. I mean, John 15, you know, John 15 is a parallel to walking in the Spirit. Jesus says, you know, you must abide in me. Let my words abide in you. You're a branch rooted into the vine. He's, Jesus is using the same picture of being completely surrendered, completely living your life in him, in his word, in prayer with him. And that's when he says, and I've appointed you to go bear fruit. And if it's this way, then it will be fruit that remains. I see many people trying to witness, trying to you know, fulfill the Great Commission, but it's not in the power of the Spirit. And I see fruit just falling away after years of effort. There is no other way. Uh, this was always the prescription that God intended for believers. It's why you see every prophet in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. It's why in the New Covenant is normative for every new believer. This was the, the prescription of how we were meant to fulfill God's purposes. Otherwise, it's fruitless and it's fruit that won't remain. If you're going to be spirit-led, you'll wind up being spirit-fed. And if you walk in the way, and Jesus said, I am the way, and it takes us all the way back to Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9, when it says to talk about the Lord when you walk along the way, and Jesus jumps in and says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. I'm the one that made you the promise that I'm leaving here. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to send you this Holy Spirit, this Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, not the Ruach uh, uh, Chaim, the, 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 the breath of life, 
I'm going to send you the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which is where your power, where your anointing, where you become a kingdom of priests. And you can only become a kingdom of priests if you are spirit-filled. Otherwise, you're nothing but a Pharisee. You're nothing but a Sadducee. You're nothing but a teacher of the law. But when you season it with the Holy Spirit, now you become fruit bearers and fishers of men, and it's recognizable. You can see the difference. And isn't that what we're called to be, is a people Absolutely. set apart? And I'd just say, honestly, you know, if, if there, anyone listening to this, if there's any doubt in your mind of whether today you're filled with the Spirit, then grab grab a hold of this. It's not because we're trying to make money off this. We're trying to get the message out that believers need to walk in the power of the Spirit. No matter your denominational category, no matter your upbringing, this is normative for the Christian life. Uh, one of my board members uh, is a Spirit-filled uh, Methodist district superintendent, and I will be sending this to him to share with the 150 churches that he oversees. Uh, I'm actually doing a conference with him in September about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. And so that falls hand in hand. He'll have a copy of this before the week is out. Steve Smith, Perfect. battling cancer, you will be victorious, my friend, and we are standing, our entire audience, around the globe, and right now we're prime time in the Middle East an area you're familiar with and countries in Africa you're familiar with are watching this program. We have followers in Kenya, in Nigeria, we have them in Uganda, we have them in India, we have them all over the world. It's a global program and they understand the spirit walk. They understand it from a native perspective and they understand it from a born again filled with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for walking us through an understanding of not only what the Spirit is, but why we need to be filled with it. The book is called Spirit Walk, The Extraordinary Power of Acts for Ordinary People. Author Steve Smith, God bless you, my friend. Safe travels thank to you. you. And thank you for sharing this incredible story with us here on Revealing the Truth. All right. Lord bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.